Hello and welcome to the CTS Train Right podcast. Today we have Dr. Alan Lim. What's up, Hillary Allen? <laughs> Isn't that great that your last name is Allen? My first name is Allen. We're like Allen and Allen. I know. And it's actually spelled the same way, which is freaky. I actually did not know that. What are we going to talk about today? Let's <laughs> talk about training. Let's talk about life. Let's talk about whatever you want. Let's talk about performance. Let's okay. talk about why people are cuckoo. Let's talk about people being on their, their high horse and telling you what to do all the time. Yeah, let's let's do that. And hopefully I won't be on a high horse since I'm a coach and <laughs> telling people what to do and giving them the wrong advice. Um, yeah. So today, uh, the topic we kind of brainstormed, um, we're going to talk about dehydration and performance. Um, but before we get into that, can you, I'm going to let you introduce yourself. Who are you, Alan Lim? Um, <laughs> yeah, I am a complicated person with very simple needs. Um, that's basically the gist of it. I'm also a trained exercise physiologist. Uh, I have my PhD from the University of Colorado under the direction of Dr. William Burns in the Applied Exercise Science Laboratory. That's where I cut my teeth. And that's where I learned that I really don't know anything um, <laughs> or that we make a lot of assumptions about what we do know. Uh, worked on the pro cycling tour for quite a bit of time. And now uh, I work at Scratch Labs where um, I am the quote unquote founder, but primarily I work on product development and future. Nice. Yeah. And that's actually, um, that's how I met you. And we uh, started our awesome relationship between, you know, you keeping me hydrated and uh, satiated during my runs. And, yes. uh, <laughs> right. but also we know we can have plenty of nerdy conversations. Yeah. Really, <laughs> Hillary, the, I, 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 I don't know if I want to tell you this, but I've really just been applying one strategy when it comes to our relationship, which is something I call halt. Every time, <laughs> you know, things might not be going wrong or right. Huh. I will tell you to just stop, halt. Mm -hmm. And then I don't know if you know this, but I go through this this whole paradigm of, yep. are you hungry? Are you angry? Are you lonely? Or are you tired? Lately, it's been a combination of all of yeah. those. <laughs> so if you're hungry, feed yourself, right? If you're angry, hopefully, you know, you can talk it out. If you're lonely, uh, I think we're going to start this little, you know, retail site where we have a bunch of puppies and you can just get in a cuddle puddle oh. with a bunch of puppies. Okay. Yeah um it's like a nap room but something different and then tired you know go to bed take a nap yeah well okay i mean that works for something but um actually a lot of things but uh so but now i want to okay we're, we're you're gonna ask me this question and i'm actually going into this blind so hopefully we both end up learning a lot um, sure so we're talking about hydration and performance yeah let me let me set the stage a little bit yeah. um i think that there is kind of a big debate about whether or not athletes um, perform better or worse if they dehydrate. So like, for example, you know, there is this whole school of thought that if you lose between two to 3% of your body weight during exercise, that that hampers your performance, that you may not be able to run as fast, go as fast, work as hard, right? Um, there's another school of thought that says, hey, you know, look, that dehydration doesn't really affect performance, that you've, you can see these incredible performances that are done with a significant level of dehydration so that, you know, people have won the, you know, <laughs> New York City Marathon at uh, five or 10% dehydration. Yeah. And so you look at those winners and you say, well, you know, is the question, could they have performed better? Or is the question that the only way they could have got that performance was to run so fast that they couldn't properly hydrate? Yeah. Or is there another idea that, hey, look, maybe their power to weight ratio improved because they were mm -hmm. offloading extra water. What is it? Right. Mm -hmm. um, so very controversial. I mean, there is, um, you know, even a great paper by, um, you know, Saka versus Noakes, where they debate this idea hmm. of whether or not uh, dehydration affects performance. Um, you know, clearly there's a lot of military, uh, you know, studies that have shown in soldiers yeah. that they, if they dehydrate, they, their performance is greatly hampered. Mm -hmm. um, and I think everyone has a different opinion of this. And I think that, you know, we uh, throw around this idea of two to 3% dehydration equals poor performance. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to ask you a question, Hillary. <laughs> Let's say that, you know, we weigh exactly the same, We're mm -hmm. probably close, right? Um, you know, I'm a, you know, yeah. <laughs> And let's say we're doing the exact same event. Okay. Okay. 
And let's say that we both lose exactly the same amount of water weight. So we dehydrate to exactly the same level. Let's also say that we've both been drinking ad libitum. Mm -hmm. So that we're both drinking according to our own sensation of thirst. Mm -hmm. And that neither of us are more or less thirsty. Both of us have lost the same amount of total water. But let's say you kick my ass. And up until that point, we were exactly equivalent. Or you could even say, that, you know, yeah all things being equal like okay. we were on track we were on the same performance time mm -hmm. you know we have the same footwork you know mm -hmm. same knowledge of the course all that sort of stuff okay and you kick my ass and yet you know our hydration levels are the same what gives and our dehydration levels are the same so can i ask like with that same percent loss of of water the same salt loss okay. so i will say this and ultimately, our aim here is to try to dissect, mm -hmm. you know, what is happening in our mm -hmm. systems that might prove that you are still capable of performing better than I am, despite the same amount of water less. Mm -hmm. And I will say this, you perform better and you lose less sodium in your sweat. So what gives? Okay. Well, at least from my knowledge of endurance sports, and I'm assuming we're participating in endurance sports. Whatever <laughs> event you want. I mean, we could be sword fighting. Okay, matter. sure. Okay, so, but still, um, a certain length of time. I would say that the uh, correlation of performance generally favors, though, with those with a with less loss of sweat, of salt. Why? Um, because I would think about it from, like, I've experienced dehydration before, and it's like this, like, wall that hits you and... Um, it's, it's something very hard to, to kind of come back from. Cause I mean, to me, like salt, it's allowing your neurons to fire appropriately, your muscles to contract appropriately, um, your whole nervous system to kind of function. And okay. so if, if you, so if let's say this, less, you know, we talked about thirst earlier and we, we talked yeah. about the fact that we were both drinking ad libitum and that mm -hmm. we are both equally, you know, satiated in terms of our thirst. Uh -huh. Um, one you know, there are two mechanisms that control thirst. One is a loss of blood volume, yeah. right? So if I shoot you and you start bleeding out, Thank you, you get really thirsty, <laughs> right? Okay. I stab you and you're like, I'm bleeding. And I'm like, I'm so thirsty. In fact, <laughs> if you ever watch the movies, uh, you know, the Free State of Jones, no. there's an opening scene in the Civil War scene okay. where this kid gets shot yeah. and he's carrying him around trying to get help for him. And he's like, I'm so thirsty. Oh. I'm so thirsty. Why am I so thirsty? <laughs> and I'm like... Well, that's why your blood volume is all over the place. <laughs> yeah. So blood volume is one thing that controls thirst. So if you uh -huh. drop your water volume in blood, then boom, you get thirsty. Mm -hmm. The other thing that controls it is your sodium concentration yeah. in your blood. So if you lose water and that sodium concentration increases, you also get thirsty. Exactly. During exercise, because our heart rates are high and our cardiac output is high, we tend to have a high blood pressure. And so mm. that sensation of uh, volume loss um, is not as apparent because mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. we have that high blood pressure. Yeah. And so uh, the sodium concentration becomes more important during mm. exercise as a thirst mechanism. Yeah. So let's assume in this scenario that our blood sodium is fine. And so mm. these ideas of, okay. you know, nervous function mm -hmm. and contractile function that you mentioned with respect to sodium's role in our own physiology are the same. Okay. Well, uh, then I would, honestly, I would go to um, toleration of discomfort or or pain or, you know, familiarity. Oh, you're just better at being dehydrated. <laughs> yeah, I'm just better at <laughs> <laughs> enduring an uncomfortable situation. And people talk about this, right? They're just like, you just need to train without water so that you like learn, your body learns how to dehydrate. <laughs> yeah. And there could be some specificity to that. Maybe. Maybe that's true. I don't know. I'm just saying I'm tougher than you, Alan. Uh, sure. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, ultimately, that, that 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 might be the safe. But let's let's take our mental fortitude out of this because clearly you are, uh, you know, mentally stronger than I am. We all know that. No. I mean, you you exercise most days of the week. I kind of I've been, you know, frittering away time watching the Queen's Gambit. <laughs> um, that's about cheese. It's about chess. Oh my god. Okay. Oh, okay. Yeah. Oh, that. I was hearing something about cheese yeah. earlier. Chess. Queen's oh, Gambit. the Queen's Gambit. Okay. Well. Okay. So pills. Um, <laughs> let's take mental, mental strength out of this. But that could be it. Hmm. What else is going on here that is really profoundly affecting our performance? And I mentioned it a little earlier, so I gave you a clue. 
Wait, in this in this interview in this or before when we were making Just coffee casual, before this? No, casually talking to you right now, I gave you a big, big, big. I gave the audience a big, big clue. Oh no. Hmm. Um. I don't know. I'm trying to rack my brain about different different. We know that you lose less salt than I do. Yeah. But we also know that the water loss is the same in this mm -hmm. scenario. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. What gives? Hmm. Come on, Hills. Come on. Think about water. Think about the <laughs> body. Think about where that water is stored. Oh, fat versus muscle? Not necessarily, but yes. You know, so go with that. Go with. Huh. This so, is... for example, when water is stored in muscle, yeah. where is it stored in the muscle? Mm. I'm trying to think of like. In the muscle. Well, in the muscle, inside like inside the cell, like mitochondria. Right. So you have an intracellular volume of yeah, water, yeah. but you have an extracellular volume of water. Yeah. So and there's salt. Let's say those. that we are seventy percent water, mm -hmm. right? And let's say <laughs> we weigh a hundred kilos. That's seventy liters of water. Mm -hmm. How many liters of that water is inside of the cell versus outside of the cell? Ooh, ooh. And people don't think about this, right? They think that all the water in our body is just in our body. But 50-50. I mean, I don't know. Like, it should depend. It should depend on each cell that you have, like, it, where it is in your body. Like, because the well, different... Well, so let's, let's, let's create two compartments right now. Okay. Let's say one compartment where water can be stored is inside of a cell, whether that's a mm -hmm. fat cell or a muscle cell or any kind of cell, mm -hmm. right? So there's an intracellular volume of water. Mm -hmm. Let's also say that there is an extracellular volume of water, mm -hmm. a volume of water outside of the cell. What is the distribution of water inside of our cells and the volume of water outside of our cells? Do you know? The I mean, I mean, it should be at, I mean, this is at equilibrium. Like it's, it should flow freely, freely between the cell wall, just dependent on if there's an area of concentration of salt greater or less than inside versus outside so let's just say yeah there's equilibrium of water so water is not moving inside or outside of mm -hmm. the cell mm -hmm. but we'll keep that in mind for later how much water is stored inside of our cells in our body versus stored outside of our cells 50 50. no we have a lot of <laughs> cells right we're mostly cells yeah absolutely. right so more like 70 30. okay right and so here are the body compartments most of our water is stored inside of our body cells, mm -hmm. right? Um, but our cells also bathe in water, right? Mm -hmm. So the space in between cells, that's called the interstitial space. Yes. And so there's a significant amount of water, maybe, um, you know, 20% of our water in the interstitial space. Mm -hmm. Let's say, you know, it's 70% uh, of the water in the inside of the cell or the intracellular space and then the rest of that body water is what's called our blood volume yeah. or our plasma volume yeah our vascular space mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. right so we have a vascular space we have an interstitial space and we have the intracellular space mm -hmm. the interstitial and the vascular space are what are known as the extracellular space mm -hmm. and so the electrolyte concentration of that extracellular space um, is the same, mm -hmm. right? The intracellular volume also has an equivalent electrolyte concentration, and that's why water mm -hmm. is not necessarily shifting between one space to another. Right. But what's the electrolyte content of those two spaces? Are they the same? Meaning, in terms of substance, mm. potassium, sodium, etc. Right, because those are all salts. I would I would say no. It depends on each cell. I mean, I was I remember this in my PhD. Uh, like we were. Like each cell has a different kind of um, voltage, right? Intercellular versus extracellular, which can mm, basically that equilibrium can be perturbed to elicit a response, like especially in a neuron. For like an action potential. Exactly. Yeah. But so what there's... maintains that? Uh, what what maintains that potential? Um, so I mean, we were talking about the beginning of this, like um, you're basically. Uh, like your salt concentration, your osmotic um, kind of pressure sensors, like those can be activated open versus closed. Um, well, 
in your cells. Ultimately, this all starts with something called a sodium potassium pump. Well, of course, that this is the leaky pump. You're constantly doing this. The, That's right. The sodium potassium pump doesn't That's necessarily right. have a uh, a mechanism to open and close it, but it's kind of it's there based on concentration differences. So, what does a sodium potassium pump do? It pumps <laughs> potassium into a cell mm -hmm. and sodium out of the cell. So, but tell me, what's the difference between potassium and sodium? They have the same charge. Yeah, there's 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 no real difference. I mean, functionally mm. in our bodies, everything could be flipped, and it probably right. the system would probably work the same. Mm -hmm. Um, it's just that they're different. And so, you know, mm -hmm. our proteins can identify and pull these two molecules yeah. apart from one another. From a chemistry point of view, there are differences in sizes. Sure. Yeah. yeah. Differences in molecular mass, et cetera. Mm -hmm. But net net from a number of things mm -hmm. or from an osmotic perspective, right? Same one mm -hmm. potassium molecule is equivalent osmotically to one sodium molecule. Mm -hmm. But my point is this, hmm. is that if you looked at the electrolyte concentration inside of a cell, you would see primarily potassium. Mm -hmm. And if you looked at the Ex el mm. electrolyte concentration in the extracellular bullion, you would see primarily sodium, sodium right? Mm -hmm. Those molecules might be balanced. There's no net movement. But ultimately, what happens when we sweat is we primarily lose sodium, sodium. not potassium, mm -hmm. right? Um, you know, it's a leaky system, so we do lose some potassium, but very little because there's mm -hmm. very little potassium in our bloodstream, right? Mm -hmm. So let me ask you this question again. You lose less salt than I do when you sweat, when you mm -hmm. lose a certain amount of water. Mm -hmm. So what happens to the concentration of your blood sodium versus the concentration of my blood sodium? Well... You, if you're losing, if you're losing more, then yours is perturbed more at a greater degree, so you have less extracellular sodium. So here's the deal. <laughs> yeah, you actually kind of got that a little backwards. Quit, because I, because because if so, if I were to lose pure saline, right? If I were yeah. to lose all of the sodium in my blood. Oh, so wait, sweat, is it a question more about the potassium that you're losing? No, no, not yet. We're not there yet. So what's happening is this is. If I were to lose more salt, mm -hmm. right, the concentration of my blood sodium would not go up as high, right? Oh. If you lost pure water, right. very little salt, right? The concentration of my your sodium, sodium would, would go, go up. Way of course, high, of course. Right? Yeah, yeah. If I lose less salt, the concentration of my sodium does not go up as high. Mm -hmm. Now, all of a sudden, between the intracellular space and the extracellular space, you have a higher sodium concentration. Mm -hmm. And so what happens now osmotically between those two spaces? Well, then more water would want to go outside to the extra, extracellular space. Exactly. Yeah. And so what happens is this, is that because you have a higher amount of sodium increase or concentration in your blood, mm -hmm. there's a greater osmotic gradient to shift water from inside of the cell into your extracellular space or into your plasma, mm -hmm. right? And ultimately, here's the deal. We could end up dehydrating exactly the same in terms of total body water loss. Mm -hmm. But your plasma volume could be preserved because of that shift. And my plasma volume could decrease. And so all of a sudden, you maintain your cardiac output. Mm -hmm. You maintain the delivery of blood, oxygen, the removal of CO2, the removal of heat. Mm -hmm. And I'm impaired mm -hmm. because even though we've lost the same amount of total water, you've been able to shift more of your stored water in cells into your blood volume. Whereas my blood volume is lower because I'm not getting that osmotic shift. So my question is, so can this be, can this be trained? Is this just, this is just a consequence of a difference in sodium loss. But this sweat. is, but this is genetic. Like this is, this is genetic. This it's, is something it's, it's determined by uh, a physiology. gene cluster called CF1, mm -hmm. um, which is named after the disease cystic fibrosis, mm -hmm, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And in cystic fibrosis, you lose all of the sodium that is in your blood. You don't yeah. have the ability to resequester sodium as that sweat or plasma goes through the sweat gland. And so what happens in a cystic fibrosis patient, and this is where this comes from, this comes from a study comparing the... Uh, difference in plasma volume between very salty sweaters, mm -hmm. cystic fibrosis patients, mm. and 
people who lose very little sodium in their sweat, mm -hmm. right? And what happens in the situation of cystic fibrosis is because they're losing fluid that is the same concentration as their blood, mm -hmm. nothing really happens to the concentration of sodium in their blood. And thus, nothing really happens to disturb mm -hmm. the concentration between the inside of the cell versus the outside of the cell. Uh -huh. And thus, water does not shift. Uh -huh. As they sweat, their blood volume is what primarily decreases. Yep. Right? In a normal individual who loses, say, a moderate amount of, of, of salt, you'll lose water both in your from your blood volume, mm -hmm. but you'll shift water from inside of your cell back into that blood volume. So you're part, losing water primarily from both inside and outside of your cell. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, if you get a situation where somebody loses you know, almost no salt, right? they get a very good, you know, shift mm -hmm. uh, of water from inside the cell into their blood volume. They're able to maintain plasma volume. Of course, losing intracellular water is going to have detrimental effects as well. Yeah. But, you know, likely the loss in blood volume is more important for performance. Absolutely. Because right? the cardiovascular implications are so huge. The yeah. other thing is, is that the person who's losing very little salt can just drink plain water. Yeah and more easily replace all the water that they lose, mm -hmm. right? Because their, you know, thirst mechanism keeps them in check. And right. that thirst mechanism better matches both water, total water loss. Mm -hmm. Whereas if you're losing a lot of salt, your thirst mechanism is going to keep you from drinking all the water you lose to prevent you from becoming hyponatremic mm -hmm. or prevent the sodium concentration from going uh, too low. So my coach always tells me to drink to thirst. Yeah. However, I wonder, mm, like in an ultra event, um, there's a certain point where I start to crave salty foods and not so so much sweet. So yeah. I would. So that, is that there doesn't, that doesn't take away your desire to drink to thirst. What it no. does is eating that salt enhances your thirst drive. Okay. And keeps your thirst drive in balance. So is that something that you're also able to listen to? Is like that that your ability to crave salt is also on par with your thirst? Maybe I I've seen less uh, work on that kind of yeah. um, that's that sodium drive. Sodium drive mm -hmm. is definitely there mm -hmm. and it's definitely connected. Mm -hmm. um, but you know, my uh, quick answer would be yes because you would rather have intake of sodium drive thirst and drive your drinking behavior mm. than oh an overconsumption of water mm. to drive sodium consumption yeah. <laughs> right you want yeah. sodium to lead that water consumption not water consumption to lead to you having to like you know crave all that salt because yeah. by that point you're probably screwed yeah i was gonna say it's too late that's right that's right but so another question then is this something that you can i mean i've heard a variety of theories on this like is this something that you can train yourself out of as far as going back to this whole idea of dehydration and I, performance i don't i don't think so i think that every uh physiological variable has some realm of training adaptation mm -hmm. let's say 10 or 15 percent whether mm -hmm. that's vo2 max or lactate threshold or economy or even say the fact that it is known that as we train more and become more heat adapted our sodium sweat becomes more dilute that's clear mm -hmm. yeah right but if you have a genetic propensity to lose an average 2000 milligrams of sodium per liter versus somebody who has a genetic propensity to only lose 500 milligrams of sodium per liter mm -hmm. once again the adage of you can't turn a donkey into a racehorse <laughs> you know comes to light certainly that person both people will have a certain level of adaptation, mm -hmm. but not a level of adaptation that puts them into a new genetic category. For sure. Hmm. So, I mean, this is the propensity for someone to kind of be, quote unquote, designed for or made for certain types of, of events. Well, this is also, I think, why maybe there is a self-selection when it comes to endurance sports mm. and that has tended in the past to self-select individuals who didn't lose a lot of salt in their sweat. But yeah. now it's probably leaning towards a more diverse group of people because the availability of uh, and the wisdom that people have around consuming salt can overcome that, hmm. right? And yeah. You certainly see that in society. And you know, some people might even say that the reason why there's such a big genetic variation in our sodium sweat loss is because civilization was built around the salt trade and that 
you know, we have manipulated society in a way to give us some advantage there with respect to our need for sodium. Um, yeah. yeah. But my whole point is this, is that this dehydration controversy is a controversy that has never looked at how much sodium we lose in our sweat. And mm. that loss of sodium in our sweat could create a hypothetical situation where two people lose the exact same water weight, but one person maintains their blood volume mm -hmm. and another person does not. And in principle or hypothetically, the person who maintains their blood volume would clearly have a performance advantage yeah. over the person who does not maintain their, their blood volume because of the necessity of cardiac output in any aerobic mm -hmm. activity. Right. Yeah. Okay. I mean, I've had, I've had Isn't my, that great? this is amazing. I mean, I've had and, my salt tested with, uh, like it was one of the, like I came and had that little suction cup put on my, yeah. on my arm. Yeah. But yeah. I mean, the lesson is ultimately replace the sodium that you lose in your sweat. The lesson is, is that if you are a person who is dehydrating, you know, you're losing a certain amount of weight and you know that your performance is being hampered. Mm -hmm. Try experimenting by consuming more sodium in either your sports drink or in the food you consume when you work out or even try sodium loading ahead of the uh, yeah. event. The if same. you're someone who, you know, dehydrates and has no performance issue, maybe you're just one of these lucky ones who does, where it doesn't matter because you're not losing a lot of salt. Yeah. The, the idea is that everyone is different. And if somebody has an experience where they know that they can dehydrate and still maintain their performance, there's probably a reason for it, but it doesn't mean that dehydration doesn't hamper performance because you can also find someone who dehydrates the same and their performance and their thermal regulation falls apart. Yeah. Right. And so I think what ends up happening, and this is the distinction between science and practice is as practitioners, we have, we come to the table with our own set of experiences. Yeah. And if we come to the table with a set of experience that says that dehydration doesn't affect my performance and we start telling everybody to behave that way, we could be screwing some people yeah. and vice versa. You know, if I come to the table and I know that dehydration really hampers performance and I come to the table and I try to make everyone overhydrate, <laughs> uh, there could be also issues. Yeah. Right. Um, but what the science tells us or explains is why both scenarios might be true. <laughs> and that human experience is actually really important in just determining this your like own the solution. In, yeah, for, for your own individual experience, but mm. that doesn't mean that you can get on your high horse and tell me what to do. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's good to be able to ask questions and to, uh, figure out what different athletes are experiencing and then, you know, troubleshoot. It's like, I feel like everyone's an N of one. That's right. That's right. And, and as that N of one, I think that you have to make sure that you know that it's you and, you know, not necessarily try to prophesize that everyone has to live that way. Right. Yeah. And, you know, I think it also means that you can heed people's advice, including my own about topics like this. Right. <laughs> no, um, I always take yours. But <laughs> I think that, that, yeah, the missing component in the dehydration debate is what about salt? Yeah. Always. And that's, I feel like that's the most important thing. Um, but now you also know that water isn't just in your body. It's distributed between effectively two compartments. And yep. those two compartments can even be broken down into three compartments. Mm -hmm. Plasma or blood, vascular, mm -hmm. interstitial between cells, and intracellular. We also know that the intracellular content of electrolyte is primarily potassium. The extracellular mm -hmm. content is primarily sodium. Mm -hmm. They're generally in osmotic balance, meaning the number of sodium molecules matches the number of potassium molecules. But then when we lose water, hmm. that changes and that can osmotically shift water from inside of the cell into the vascular space. Yep. Right. And that can have performance implications that can also drive thirst. So the next component is, well, what are you also putting in your mouth and through your gut? So it's <laughs> multifactorial and complex. Yeah. Oh man, but that, that's like it's. I love it because it's it's the mo one of the most basic things that yeah. we have to listen to every day. That's right. So we talked about sodium potassium pumps. We talked about osmosis. We talked about sodium uh, sweat sweat yeah. glands adaptations genetics. Ah! <laughs> so okay, this leads me to we'll 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 wrap up this. But um, your best piece of advice for athletes who are experiencing or suffering from dehydration and how they can kind of troubleshoot. Yeah, I think the first piece of advice is, um, you know, get a scale, 
uh, try to quantify what that dehydration is mm, yeah um, and try to understand how different environments and different circumstances may cause more or less loss and try to put together or associate for yourself whether or not that impacts uh, your performance whether that's you know actual speed or that's you know a variable like you know how much strain you're experiencing in terms of perceived exertion or say cardiac drift heart rate increase you know for a given pace um, you know with that in mind I would say this that if you are experiencing a performance detriment or if you're experiencing heat illness things of this nature two potential solutions the first solution is that maybe you just have your logistics wrong <laughs> maybe you're just not uh, you know, able to get enough water to appropriately drink ad libitum or mm. appropri appropriately uh, quench your thirst. And so we had to do things with training rides here in Boulder in the summertime, for example, where we might pick a route and just park a car in one location that is loaded with a cooler <laughs> of, you know, ice cold bottles, water, everything that you might need and, you know, end up on a big, long seven hour training day doing multiple laps of a course just mm. so that we can always get back to a water source. Yeah. And, you know, when you think about your racing, you've got to just figure out the logistics because much of the time, this is not a physiological problem. This is a logistical problem. Yeah. And, you know, this is why Napoleon won <laughs> wars because he figured out the freaking logistics, <laughs> right? I love it. He, yeah. canned, he canned food. Yeah. And yeah. his soldiers didn't go hungry. Yeah. Right. Great. Um, if it's not logistics, then the next big piece of advice is start experimenting with increasing your sodium intake during these long bouts of exercise, and mm -hmm. then use that increase in sodium to drive your thirst, drink to thirst, and then see if that changes what the scale tells you, mm -hmm. right? And yeah. see if that changes how you perform. Because even with the scale, you don't know if that water loss is distributed more uh, to blood volume loss or intracellular loss, right? Yeah. Um, and then, you know, last piece of advice beyond keeping your sodium game in check is to continue listening to yourself. Um, not necessarily, how about this, taking everybody's advice with a grain of salt oh. and not being one of these, uh, you know, nimrods who then... <laughs> having figured it out, tries to go and tell everybody what to do based upon your experience because that may not actually apply to anyone. I love it. This is perfect. And Boom. great pun at the end there. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Gotta love a science pun. But, well, this is super informative. Thanks um, again. It's always a pleasure talking with you, Alan. Yeah. Uh, we'll draw pictures next time. Oh, yeah. Okay. We can, <laughs> we can post it. <laughs> That's right. But all right. Thanks so much for taking the time today. And um, I hope everyone learned something about dehydration and, and performance. I, I definitely, I definitely did. Yeah. It's always going to be controversial, but there's a reason why. Yeah.